Good morning. It's Friday, everyone. Hope everybody's good. Getting ready for the weekend, TGIF. So, uh, yeah, we're uh, Pastor Rob here. Hope you're having a great day. Um, we're getting ready to view our lesson number 51 in Mark chapter 14. Here we are covering the last evening, actually, of Jesus' life. We uh, He had the upper room discourse, John 13 through 17, spending his last night with his most intimate friends and uh, dining with them, as would be typical. And even today, we would do that before we leave to go somewhere or go on a trip or go away. We would like to be with our most often. We like to be with our friends and family before we depart. Uh, and we left Jesus in Gethsemane <clears throat> before his arrest. We know Judas has agreed after his second public chastisement by Christ, he he chastised him twice when he was anointed. He told Judas that uh, he rebuked him publicly. Judas had had enough, so he went and made a deal with the priest to sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, in Zechariah 11, 12, and 13, it was prophesied. It came to fruition, Psalm 41, 9. The person who has broke bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. That's speaking of Judas as well and his betrayal. And so now we pick up today in Mark chapter 14, verse 41. Um, Jesus has finished his prayer in Gethsemane. The sins of the world have come upon his body. And he's about to go through uh, a six-phase trial. He's going to have three trials with the Jews. One with Ananias, one with, or Annas, one with Caiaphas, and one on the Sanhedrin. That'll be the Jewish side of his trials. They all abuse him. Uh, you know, as a lamb, he was, he doesn't say much except when it comes to his deity, he, he, uh, he verifies his deity before them. And then he's going to go have his trials before, uh, the Romans that would be Herod and Pilate. And of course, Pilate and Herod become friends at this time. And that'll be, uh, his other part. So he's going to be tried all night after he leaves Gethsemane. He's tried all night till early in the morning when Pilate hands him over to the uh, the religious leaders, the corrupt. If you read this and go through this, the corrupt religious leaders, um, he hands them over and then he's eventually crucified. So if you want to know more about this, so this is all covered in all four Gospels. It's in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 18. This covers uh, the last night or the last uh, week of Jesus' life, his, his arrest trial, and his crucifixion, all in those four books. So let's pick up here in Mark chapter 14, verse 41. Jesus returns the third time to his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and finds them sleeping again. And he asks this question, are you still sleeping and resting? Well, enough. The hour has come. Now remember, when you see the hour, that means this is a significant event. This is something pre-prescribed for Christ that on God's sovereign timeline, this hour, this moment, this pre-ordained moment before time began, 1 Peter 1.20, Acts 2.23, Acts 4.28, uh, I think it's 1 Timothy 1.9 maybe is another verse. It covers that before time, this moment had been ordained for Christ, that he would come to the earth and redeem the human race uh, to, to Jesus, to, to himself and to God. And so, this is all before the first foundational brick of the world was laid. This plan was in effect. So, this hour has now come, this moment, in perfect timing, as God said it would. The hour has come, and he says, look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Of course, they all sin. Remember, he was sinless until he took our sin upon him, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 5, 21, I think it is. But yeah, uh, he became sin. So he knows it's coming. Nobody in John 10 takes his life away from him. He lays it down. He could call angels to his rescue if he wanted to. Uh, he could have had his disciples fight for him, and they would have gladly done that, as Peter will show. But he doesn't. In perfect obedience to his father, he's going to willfully be arrested and tried and then crucified. So the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's go. Here comes my betrayer. He knows it's Judas. He knew it was Judas. And it says in verse 43, just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared 
uh, and with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, there are some varying accounts here. All, all of it agree. There's just different details in each book. Matthew says a little bit more, Luke, and then John. And John has one of my favorite accounts, and I'll, and I'll explain it in a second. <clears throat> now, the betrayer had arranged with the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, the corrupt temple system that Jesus is going to destroy. Um, he's His presence is gone. It's not being used as it was meant to be used and designed to be used as a house of prayer and worship. It is a corrupt way uh, uh, for um, the priests to make money. They're ripping people off. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. And so Jesus is going to bring it down. And this is more evidence showing their depth of their corruption. The chief priest, teacher of the law, and the elders are here with a military unit to arrest Jesus Christ. Verse 44, now that the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Lead him away under guard. So going at once to Jesus, Judas kissed and said, Rabbi. He kissed him on the cheek. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Now I want to pause there. That's verse 46 of Mark 14 because I want to go to John 18. I think this is just a Rob thing, but I want to point this out. I think it's very special. Um, so in John 18... Another account of Christ's arrest in the garden in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knowing, John 18, verse 4, Jesus knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked this contingent that Judas has brought, who is it that you want? And they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. And I love this response in John verse 18, verse 5. He says, I am. I am he. Uh, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. And that's not in any of the other Gospels. It's in John alone. And I love this. I think it's kind of like a foreshadowing of, number one, that Jesus is being uh, is not being taken in weakness. He's being taken in strength and willingly. He's laying his life down. He's not being conquered by men. He has the power to... Uh, withstand and avoid this arrest if he wants it. And this is just a little peek, but one of the things I like to say here, and, and this is something I found in my studies way back, and I, it's one of the things, this is a Rob thing, it's in the scripture, but you can apply it as you see fit. When, they, when he says, I am he, and they drew back and fell to the ground, number one, it shows he's being arrested, obviously against his will, but in obedience to God, not in weakness, uh, he's giving his life over to these men. He could take it at any time. But secondly, I think this is a foreshadowing of Revelation 19. And you can agree with me or disagree with me, and, I, and that's up to you. But um, when people talk about the end times and the end, the battle of Armageddon and the final judgment, I believe that this John 18 verse is a foreshadowing of the dominance that Christ will have when the battle between all that is evil and all that is good happens for the final battle in Revelation 19, a foreshadowing. He says, I am he. He's saying, I am, basically, is what he's saying. He said the same thing in John 8, 58. And the soldiers fall to the ground. There was nothing they could do. They were powerless. And so if you look at Revelation 19, verse 14, it says, the armies of heaven are following, basically, they're following Jesus Christ to the final battle on the earth. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. Now, they're ready for war, but they're dressed in fine linen, which means that we, this is the church following him, are royalty following our king into battle, but we're dressed uh, in fine linen. We're not going to fight. The battle is won. Christ is going to fight the battle for us, we're dressed in fine linen. We're on white horses. He's leading the way. Dressed in fine linen, white and clean. This speaks of the righteousness that we have upon us from Jesus Christ in our glorified bodies, not in our human bodies any longer. And we are not going to fight. So verse 15 of Revelation 19 says this, Out of his mouth comes a sharp, sharp sword. Now this is the word, speaking of the word of God. And so you're going to read through this all the way over to Revelation 19, 21. And it talks about the battle. Let's go to 20. The armies gather together to make war against the rider on the horse. So they want to battle with Jesus Christ. The, the beast was captured. With him, the false prophet who had performed miraculous signs. 
With all these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. So there's this image erected. All the human race at this time is, is under the power and the influence and deception of the beast, the false prophet. And they're worshipping his image. And it says the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. But verse 21 is, is unique. The rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. And I believe John 18 is a foreshadowing this. Who are you here to arrest? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And the entire contingent falls to the ground. When he comes out of the sky... And these, the beast and the false prophet are already subdued and conquered. This is the same thing that's going to happen. When they say, who is this that comes out of the sky? Or however this is fulfilled, he's going to say, I am. And the war is going to be over. We won't be fighting. We won't be swinging swords. Jesus is going to speak the words, I am. And this battle in Revelation 19 will be over. And I believe that's a Rob thing. This is not a theological thing or anything I've ever read, but... Something to think about is that when they come to arrest him, I believe this is a foreshadowing of Revelation 19 because he says, I am he, and they fall to the ground. And so anyway, just just something to take a note. I thought it was interesting. Check it out. See what you think. And so we're back here in uh, John 14. And uh, this is when Judas, verse 45, uh, the men, verse 46, Jesus is arrested. And then one of those standing near uh, Jesus drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest. Now, Jesus doesn't need anybody to fight his battles. He's here to fight ours. And that's what he's doing by going to the cross. He's going to battle death and the power of sin. He's going to win. He's going to restore us back to God through his work. And, if, and we, will be, uh, we will be recipients of his righteousness, forgiveness, and mercy and grace. And so then one of those standing near drew his sword. Now, this doesn't tell who this is. That's kind of like Mark tries to avoid us, but we find out that in John 18, 10, this is Peter. Peter pulls a sword. He cuts the servant of the high priest's ear off to try to defend Jesus, who doesn't need defending. And um, that servant's name is Malchus. Mark doesn't give us those names. John does. So uh, Peter basically could just read this way in, in, in 1447. Then Peter, standing near, drew his sword and struck Malchus, the servant of the high priest's ear off. You could write that there without violating scripture. Because it's in, or just make a note, it's in uh, 18, uh, 1810. And then another thing here, just so you know, just more evidence that Christ is giving up his life in obedience to, to the Father, is that Jesus addresses this situation with Peter as he cuts um, Malchus's ear off. Jesus responds this way, Do you think, and this is Matthew, by the way, Matthew um, 26, 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But if he did that, he says basically, but then how would the scriptures be fulfilled, be fulfilled that say my betrayal, my crucifixion and these things must happen this way? Remember, this hour is a sovereign timeline. He said, if I do anything other than what the Father has commanded me to do, I'd be violating what I came here for and the sovereign timeline of God. So, back over here where he gets the ear cut off in, in Mark 14, 47, Jesus responds after that to the men to come to arrest him. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me. But... Very key, the scripture must be fulfilled. This is where your Zechariah 11, 12, and 13 come in. Psalm 41, 9, Isaiah uh, 53, 53, 7, Zechariah 13, 7. All these things are being fulfilled uh, in these scriptures. And, and so on. Isaiah 53, the whole chapter, is probably the greatest uh, reflection or foretelling of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Very specific and very scripted. So if you want to write that in here for a note to read Isaiah 53, that would be good. And the reason they didn't arrest him before, it wasn't that he was leading a rebellion. It's just that they were afraid to arrest him before because the crowds were around and they knew the crowds would turn on them. They didn't want that unpopularity. They didn't want to die for trying to capture Jesus Christ either. So 
So verse 49 of Mark 14, every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts and you did not arrest me, but scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. And that would go along with um, uh, Zechariah 13, 7, that uh, all have betrayed me, all have left me. I am alone. And so uh, that's just one of the verses that's foretelling that as a prophecy. And um, let me look at one more thing here. That's it. Okay. So, and I don't know this. Now, I, <laughs> we've had discussions about the next couple of verses. I truly don't understand them. Um, but it's in here, so we'll read them. So everybody deserts Jesus and flees after his arrest. His disciples, you'll see they're following him at a distance during his trial. Remember, he's going to be tried all night from Thursday night all the way into Friday morning. He's going to have six trials minimum. And then he's going to be beaten and crucified that following morning, Friday morning. So this is Thursday night. This is the arrest of Christ. He's headed for his six trials. His disciples are fleeing him, but they're going to stay at a distance. And of course, we know the women are always at a distance watching to see what's going on as well. And then in verse 51, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, naked leaving his garment behind. Now, I don't know. This is just a possibility, like a theory. Maybe this is the garment, maybe, that they put on Jesus uh, when they make fun of him after his arrest. Maybe they use this linen garment. It was a nice garment, and I'm guessing, I don't know. I just thought maybe that's why this is here, because it says later on they dressed him in linen. They bowed to him. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They beat him. They mocked him, but he had this linen garment on, and perhaps this is where they got that garment theory. I don't know. So we're going to stop there today. That's Jesus arrest in Gethsemane before his trial. He's going to have six trials, three before the Jews, three before the Romans, before he's turned over to the Jews for his crucifixion. So, um, well, that's where we're at today. This is Friday. I hope you guys have a great weekend. If you're looking for some reading, read, uh, read, uh, all the accounts of Jesus arrest, Mark 14, Matthew 26, Luke 22, John 18. And if you want to learn more about Jesus' crucifixion, read Zechariah and read um, Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. I'll talk about the crucifixion and the prophecies about Christ's arrest, birth and everything, by the way. But specifically Isaiah 53. So I hope everybody has a great weekend. That was Lesson 51. We'll see you next week and we'll pick up on Mark 14, 53.